All right, well, please turn your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, we will continue our exposition of Paul's first letter to Timothy. Last week, we uh, began looking at this text, and, and we saw there in the text that the church is a covenanted community. That is, God has brought us into this body and to himself by way of covenant. And we are also a, a community that is covenanted one to another. We saw that we have um, obligations, responsibilities to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're not just passive in the life of the church. And Dustin then came up after and was able to help flesh that out a bit and talk about what it means to be in covenant together. If you weren't here and missed that, we have a recording on a you, you do well to listen to that. I can, I can point you in the direction to find that. Um, today we're going to see, Lord willing, that the church is a confessional community. The church is a confessional community. Now what I want to do in this message today is ask and hopefully answer five questions. I'll just read them to you briefly. Um, what does it mean to confess the faith, as we'll see in this text? What does it mean to confess the faith? What is confessional Christianity? What is a confession of faith? And then the all-important question, number four, is there biblical warrant for all of this confessionalism, for confessions? And if so, number five, how can churches be helped by confessions of faith? So that's where we're going today. And uh, I'm going to begin reading here in uh, verse 14. Once again, 1 Timothy 3, 14. And this is God's holy word. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great, indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. May God bless today the preaching of His Word. Let's pray. Father, we, 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 we ask for help. We need help to hear. We need help to understand. We need help to focus. I most certainly need help, God, to, uh, for this message to be helpful, for this message to be biblical and, and edifying. So, God, would you send a great measure of your Spirit today to fill us? Would you give me um, a boldness, but also a humility, Lord, to speak as I ought to speak? Bless those that hear this message. Um, give us strength, O oh God. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. No creed but the Bible. No confession but Christ. These are statements that are often made from Christian pulpits. Maybe you've been in churches where this was the, this was the refrain, this was sort of the character of the church, that we, we, we are opposed to man-made creeds and confessions. Uh, maybe today you hold a similar position. You're skeptical of, of creeds and confessions and catechisms. I mean, aren't we Baptists? Aren't we supposed to be the people of the book, right? We have the infallible, inspired Word of God. And doesn't Paul say to Timothy that this Word is sufficient for us? That it's all that we need to be complete in Christ? Why would we then want man-made statements about Christianity. There's a problem with the statement, no creed but Christ. And the problem is that it is a creed in itself. It is a statement about the Bible that is not found in the Bible, which is what a basically a creed is. And so the reality is not, are we creedal or confessional or not? The real distinction is that some churches publicly publish their creeds and confessions, so they're opened up for public scrutiny. 
In some churches, they're a bit more hidden. Maybe it's just the theology of the pastor, what he holds to. Let me give you an example of how this might play out. If we were to go to a church that said, no creed but Christ, we don't have confessions of faith, and we had a new baby, and we said, should I bring my baby for baptism? Or if we asked the question, was Jesus Christ created by the Father at the Incarnation? Or if we asked the pastor, is there going to be a secret rapture of the church followed by a seven-year tribulation? The church is going to have answers to those questions. They're going to have confessional positions on those statements, right? They're going to have a theology. The problem is it's not public and no one really knows what it is. So you have to sort of pull it out. And so the distinction is not confessional or not. The distinction is really, are we up front with what we believe? Or is it just the thoughts of one man, one pastor? And so what I hope to show today, my goal really, is to show that confessional Christianity, creedal, if you will, Christianity, is fundamental to what it means to be a biblical Christian. It is intrinsic in our heritage as truth lovers and truth holders. We are a confessional people. And and you can be the judge if I state that case when we're done. And so Paul says here, back in our text, that the church, as we saw last week, is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. A pillar and buttress of the truth. Now, if you've been to the east side of Medford in the last probably couple years, over there by Rogue Regional, by the Asante Hospital, you've seen some pretty large construction projects taking place. You've seen the massive cranes that they have there, and you've seen the giant, probably, at least giant for Medford, giant parking structure that they're building there on on that site. And when you drive by, you see that massive structure, the thousands of yards of concrete that have gone into that building, but we all know that there's something beneath the surface that we don't actually see, right? You can't see the holes that were dug and the truckload after truckload after truckload of concrete that was dumped into the ground and all of the steel rebar that is encased in that concrete. There's a foundation that was laid, right? There are massive footings Massive footings that are under that building that are holding up that structure. So when the ground erodes, when the storms come, when the building begins to shift, the whole thing doesn't collapse and fail. You can't see it with your eye, but there is a foundation that was laid to hold up that massive structure. And so Paul says that the church is to be the pillar and the buttress of the truth of God's Word, of the theology contained in God's Word. That word pillar is a column, and maybe he has in mind those those large Roman buildings that you might see in a textbook or in a picture. Maybe you've had the privilege of traveling across the world and seeing those large white structures with all of the white columns. The church is the pillar, the column that supports the structure of the building, that holds up that massive weight. And the church is also, he says, the the buttress or the base or the foundation as well. And I think we see the picture that Paul is painting. The church is to be the faithful steward and guardian of the truth. And that is the truth contained in Scripture. We as members of the body of Christ, have been given the task of preserving the purity of the truth, but not just locking it away in a vault, right? Remember the servant that got the talent, and what did he do? He hid it away. And I remember as a young Christian reading that and saying, yeah, he kept it. He still has it. And he was scolded by his master, right? Because he did nothing with it. So we don't hide the truth of God's word in a vault, Yes, we keep it pure, but we are to pass it down to the next generation. And so we see from the beginning that the church is the foundational structure that has been tasked to keep God's word 
pure, to preserve the truth, to uphold the truth. And we've been seeing that as we've been in 1 Timothy. We read in 2 Timothy that, that Timothy is to follow the pattern of sound words that he heard from Paul. There is a pattern of healthy teaching or sound doctrine that Timothy is to follow. And then in 2 Timothy 2, he is to take what he has heard from Paul in the presence of many witnesses and entrust that to faithful men. So he is to follow that sound doctrine and he is to pass on that sound doctrine. Uh, we read in Jude, that little book of Jude that is so packed full of good stuff. We read in Jude 3, he says, I was eager to write to you about our common salvation. Jude had a burden to rejoice in the riches of Christ with his fellow brothers and sisters. But he says, I found it necessary, because of the climate of the things that were happening in the church, I found it necessary to write to you appealing that you contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So even back in this apostolic age, Jude says that there is the faith that has been once delivered for all the saints. We've been learning and reading and studying that elders and teachers are to teach this truth to the church. They are to handle rightly, as Paul says, this truth. They're to hold it with a good conscience, we saw. We see elsewhere in the Bible that it is in the truth that the church is being built up. We've seen Paul addressing false teachers, and we learn that these teachers are dangerous and bankrupt. And why is that? Because he says they are devoid of the truth. They have swerved from the truth, and their followers turn away from listening to the truth. We read in Romans chapter 1 that God's wrath is being poured out and will be poured out on all of those that suppress the truth in their sin and exchange the truth of God for a lie. And we read that salvation itself, to be saved, is to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so the truth is central to Christianity. And we as the church are to be that pillar, that foundation, that structure that upholds and preserves and passes on the truth. And Paul continues on here and he says these words, Great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. So the first question was, what does it mean to confess the faith? What does it mean to confess the faith? We just confessed our sin, right, a few minutes ago. I think we probably use that word more often in that manner than we do in this sense, right? When you hear someone confessed to a crime... They admitted their guilt, right? They admitted their sin. When your child comes and confesses something to you, they're telling you how they were wrong. But we're using that word in a different sense here. Noah Webster says that to confess in this way is to own, to avow, or to publicly declare belief in something. To publicly own or declare belief in something. And you know the words of Romans chapter 10, I believe it's verse 9, where Paul says that we must confess with our mouth that what? That Jesus is Lord, right? That is the most basic confession of Christianity. Jesus is Lord. And so confessing the faith is professing the faith. It is identifying and affirming the central teachings of the Bible. As Paul says, great indeed, we confess the mystery of godliness. And then he articulates this creedal, confessional little statement about the work of Jesus. And so to confess the faith is basically to profess 
the faith, to hold to what the Bible teaches. So what then is confessional Christianity? Maybe that feels redundant. If, if confessing is believing what the Bible says, then shouldn't we all be confessional? Well, confessional Christianity believes that the Bible teaches various doctrines. The Bible teaches us things that we are to believe. The Bible presents to us a body of truth, if you will, a body of divinity, a system of theology. That is the faith once for all delivered that we are to contend for. That is the pattern of sound words that Timothy was to follow and to hold to. That is that good deposit that Timothy is in charge to guard. He is to guard that good deposit. Chad Van Dixhorn says it like this. He says, Confessional Christianity affirms an allegiance to Christ. That's Christianity, right? But also to a body of truth that we love because of Christ. That we love because of Christ. Because Christ was a preacher, right? And Christ is the one that leaves us with this body of truth. And so confessionalism wants to understand and encapsulate that body of truth often by way of confessions, creeds, and catechisms. And so what is a confession of faith? What is a confession of faith? Maybe you're familiar with confessions, maybe you're not, maybe you're somewhat familiar but you've never really been in a place that used them in any real sense. A question that maybe comes to mind when we ask this is, is the scripture not enough? And maybe you're thinking that right now. Why, why would we need this? We have the Bible, right? And, and we believe in sola scriptura because we're Protestants, right? We believe in the sufficiency of the Bible. We believe in the authority of the Bible. So why would we need a man-made creed? Let me just say from the beginning that confessions are always subordinate to the Bible. They're secondary to the Bible. They don't stand over the Word as an authority. But when they are good, creeds and confessions, they summarize the Bible's teaching. Right? They bring into few words the teaching of the Bible. Now we still might say, you know what, I don't, I don't think we, we want to do that. I don't think we should do that. It's just the Bible. That's all we need. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God. Let's just stick with that. We should not make man-made creeds and confessions. Maybe, maybe that's, that's where you are today. If we take that thinking, only the Bible, only the Bible, if we take that thinking to its logical conclusion, we have to get rid of a lot of things that we use. We have to throw away Bible commentaries. We have to throw away systematic theologies. We have to throw away, really, us debating about interpreting the Bible, because if it's just the Bible, we're, as we talk about it, we're forming creedal conclusions. We certainly have to do away with preaching, because who wants to hear some guy rant for 45 minutes about what he thinks about the Bible? And so all those things have to go. And I don't think anybody really believes that. Some do that far. The reality, beloved, is confessionalism is inescapable. Because as soon as we tell our child, God made you, or God is the creator of all things, we're making creedal formulations. We're taking what the Bible teaches and summarizing it into small statements. Let me give you an example. And this is from Burke Parsons. What is that maybe first song that we teach smallest of children about Jesus? Je let's sing it. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's all I know, because I wasn't sung that song. But <laughs> just that little statement, right? We have made doctrinal conclusions and formulations in this song. We have summarized the love of Jesus Christ towards sinners, that the Messiah loves men. We have communicated that I can be an object of the love of Jesus Christ. Now, we have 
communicated that my source of revelation about the love of Jesus is found in the scriptures. That's how I can know that Jesus loves me, because the Bible says it. We've made a statement about our assurance that we can have of the love of Jesus Christ. We've made a statement about the authority of the Bible, because we're saying, because the Bible says it, then you can know it to be true. And so you can't escape this creedal formulation, making statements, summarizing what we believe the Bible says. And so what is a confession? What is a creed? A creed is usually a short statement about the main teaching of the Bible. When we take the Lord's Supper, we, we recite the Apostles' Creed. Right? It's a summary statement about what the Bible teaches, the, the essentials. Confessions are usually larger, and they're usually tied to some tradition of Christianity. So the Church of England has the 39 Articles. The Presbyterians have the Westminster Standards. Particular Baptists have had the London Baptist Confession of Faith, which I've been putting before you these last four years. These are meant to serve the church, to be a help to the church, to give us guardrails on what is orthodoxy and what is not. But they are always subservient to the Word of God. They are only helpful insofar as they summarize what the Bible teaches. And so, the fourth question, I think probably the most important, is there biblical warrant for doing this, for writing creeds and confessions? I want to look at two passages. And the first is Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13. So if you can bring your mind all the way back to the Exodus and sort of think about what is going on here. God has delivered His people. They were in bondage and slavery for 400 plus years. They were separated from the the presence of God in any meaningful sense. They didn't have the, the worship that they would later And they've been delivered, and they've been spared. Their firstborn have all been spared through this Passover meal. And God is anticipating that there will be a day, as they're to take the Passover every year, that their children will come and say, why do we do this? What's the point of this whole ritual? And so if you look at verse 14, Exodus 13, 14, And when in time to come, your sons ask you, What does this mean? You shall say to him, By a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. And so again, God is anticipating a day when the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren of those that saw His mighty deeds, those kids that were not there, that don't remember what Yahweh did, that didn't see it with their eyes, they're going to come and say, why do we do all of this? Why are we sacrificing lambs? Why are we eating the meal in this way? And we see that God expects His people here to do two things. To preserve the truth and to pass down the truth. He expects His people to preserve the truth and to pass down the truth. They are to remember what God did, to know the mighty works of God. They are to reflect upon what he did, to contemplate what he did. And then to summarize and synthesize God's words in their own words and pass them down to their children. To take all that God has done and say it in a way that the kids can understand. To summarize after they've thought about and contemplating. And so this may not be a a, a robust confession of faith, but what we see in this text is really early formulation of a creedal tradition. And that is God's people taking God's words, taking God's works, reflecting on them, 
summarizing them and restating them in our own words as a means of passing down the faith. And let me give you an example. I'm sure if you have children and you've been in church, everyone does this and has done this. If you have little kids or you had little kids and they're in church with you, at some point they looked at you and said, Mom, why do you eat bread and drink wine? And I, why can't I have any? Right? Everyone's been asked that question at some point from the kids. Why do we do this ritual? Why are we drinking juice and eating bread? What's the point? Why is the guy up front making a big deal about it? Why do we all eat it together? And why can't I have a bite? How come I'm not partaking with you? Anybody ever been asked that question? You all have, right? And so what did you do? Did you only open up 1 Corinthians 11, read the text, close it, and walk away? Maybe you opened up the Bible. That's great if you did. But I think, more realistically, what you did is you took a lifetime of theological reflection. All that you've been taught, all that you've thought about Jesus, His work, the cross, His blood, your sin, His atonement, your forgiveness, His lordship, what this sign means, all of the times you've taken the Lord's Supper, all that you've been taught, all that you've read, all that you've heard, and you synthesized all of that data and you summarize it into your own words, and you communicated it back to little Johnny in a way that he could understand, right? What did you do? You, you formulated something of a creed or something of a confession. You took God's words, and you summarized them in an easy way to understand. And that's all we're really talking about here in the, in the essence of it. J.V. Fesco says it like this, God expects His people to take his authoritative revelation, to reflect on it, study it, and restate it in their own words, and pass it down to future generations. And so this is part of our heritage, of what it means to be Christian, to be confessional, to pass down the faith. And the next text is a text we read earlier, and that's Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. So please turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now, this is a very important passage in the life of the Jews and the piety of the Hebrew people. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, this is known as the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love Yahweh, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And so this prayer Specifically, especially verse 4, was a prayer that any faithful Hebrew would recite every day, morning, and evening. This was central to their experience as a Jew. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And again, Dr. Fesco points out that this becomes the central dogma, teaching of what it means to be Jewish. Think with me for a moment about Israel and all of the nations around them. What was the one unique thing about the religion of the Jews that was distinct from every other pagan nation? They had one God. One single solitary God. They were monotheist. For us, that doesn't sound like all that big of a deal. But in that day... They were different than everyone else. And God makes a big deal about this, right? Dustin read a, a, a good text with the Rock of Ages. The Lord says, I am Yahweh, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. He goes on, that they may know from the rising of the setting of the sun that there is no 
one besides me. I am Yahweh, and there is no other. Is it not I, he says, Yahweh, and there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior? There is none except me. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. This was the main thing that marked off Israel from all of the other nations. A strict monotheism. Belief and devotion to the one God. The true and living God. And so this prayer, this short confession, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, becomes extremely valuable and central to the Jews, to their religion. One, if one reason for that is because it's a reminder for them of the covenant. Notice what it says, the Lord, our God. The Lord, our God. Every day the Jews would pray and recite these words, reminding themselves that their God was the God of the covenant. That they were united together in covenantal union with this God, so much so that they bore, the males did, the sign of the covenant in their flesh. He had adopted them. He had delivered them. He had led them. He had planted them in the land of promise later after this. And so this prayer is a way to praise and worship our God, the covenant God. It's a reminder of the covenant. But it's also a confession of their faith. It is a short, tiny confession of their faith. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. This would cement, one commentator says, the fact in their minds that Yahweh and Yahweh alone was to be the object of their faith, the object of their adoration and their allegiance. I mean, think about the Ten Commandments. What is the first commandment? God's most important priority. You shall have no other gods before me. Right? Worship none but me. And if we think about the failings of the Jews, the sin of the Jews, the falling away of the Jews, it was almost always tied to their idolatry, to their wandering after the gods of their neighbors, of the, the pagans around them. And so God is ingraining in their minds with this short confession of faith, we serve one God, Yahweh and Him alone. And lastly, this prayer is used uh, as a means of catechesis or teaching of the family. Let me look at it again, this instruction given firstly to the fathers, but then to all. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. So these that hear this, they're to hear the word, they're to receive the word, they're to have the word on their heart, they're to love the God of the word, they're to bind it on their hands and put it before their eyes and place it at the doorpost of their house and on the fence of their gates. But they're also then to take that word, reflect upon that word, and teach it diligently to their children. And so again, God is expecting His people to take what He's told them, take His word, what they've learned, and bring it into their own words. And look how all-encompassing their life was in this. When you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, God says, speak of my word. Speak of my commandments. Give instruction to your family. And so I think that we see, going all the way back to the nation of Israel, that confessing the faith is at the very foundation of who the people of God are. Yahweh's people have always been a people that take His word, take His works, praise Him for them, and then pass them on to the next generation. And He shows us one way of doing that is by creedal formulations, short summaries of what His Word teaches that will stick in people's minds and it will help them stay on the right path. 
And so this is what Paul does, and we're not going to get into this text today, uh, verse 16, but this is what Paul does. He writes a short confession of faith. He, he summarizes the work of Jesus Christ. Right? He starts at the, at the Incarnation. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Some even believe this was a short hymn, a very early hymn in the Christian church. We see other formulations like this in the Bible, short confessional statements. Another one is potentially 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, I deliver to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. Sort of a short summary of the Gospel. Another one is Philippians chapter 2, known as the Carmen Christi, the Christ hymn, also thought to be an early hymn. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Right? He did not count equality with God, something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Uh, a short summary of what Christ did. And so we see these in the Bible. We even see that in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Jesus affirms the Shema, which we just read in Deuteronomy 6, as the greatest commandment. He affirms that to be central to the teaching of the Old Testament in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. And he recites that exact prayer. And so we see this idea of confessing the faith is sort of at the foundation of what it means to be Christian. We are a people of the truth. So how can we be helped by them? How can the church benefit? I, I typed these out for you and printed them. Um, I have ten. I have ten. Um, and I'll be brief with these. But how can churches be helped? And I want to show a variety of of ways. How can we be helped by a confession of faith? Maybe you've been in a church that has a statement of faith. Oftentimes it's on the website, it's printed somewhere, but it's not really used practically within the body in any sort of meaningful way. We, we here today, we hold to the Baptist Faith and Message, which is the, which is the document that the Southern Baptist Convention holds to. Um, but it sort of sits on a shelf, right? I bet most people are not familiar with it. We haven't used it in a meaningful way. And so how can churches actually be helped by creeds and confessions? The first thing they do is they draw a line between truth and error. They draw a line between truth and error. If you go today, if you're a new believer, and you go on the internet and start Googling stuff about Christianity, it's a wild world out there. <laughs> And you're going to come across all sorts of stuff. It's people speaking authoritatively, sounding wise, like they know what they're talking about. But do they? Right? Are they sound? Creeds and confessions help to delineate that line. Help us to see, in summary fashion, what the church has believed to be true. Uh, you may be familiar uh, with a man named Arius. Anybody heard that name before? Arius? He was the guy that, I think in a Christian sense, got slapped by St. Nicholas at the Council of Nicaea. But he was a heretic. And this is way back in the 300s. And he was, he was preaching something to the effect of Jesus being less than God. He said there was a time when the Son was not. And if Jesus is not eternal, Jesus is not God, right? And he was a charismatic fellow, and he was doing what heretics do. He was putting his heresy to song. And so people began to sing these little jingles, and it was sticking. And so the church said, we have to address this guy. We have to, we have to expose his false teaching. And they sat him down, him and his, and his cohorts, and they opened up the Bible. And they said, agree to this verse. Agree to this verse. And he kept agreeing to verses that should have denied what he believed. But he was twisting them as we can and, and saying, oh, I believe that about Jesus. I, I believe that verse. And so they were kind of stuck. What do we do? We know that he doesn't really hold to what the Bible says here. How do, we, how do we solve this? And so they wrote out a summary. They wrote a creed. And they said, this is what we believe the Bible teaches. This is what the Word is saying. And he said, I'm not touching that thing. Right? I, I don't believe that. 
And so any heretic can say, I believe the Bible, right? Uh, on Saturdays, you might have some very friendly people that come to your door. They have a briefcase. Maybe they have a suit on. They have something called the watchtower, right? And they'll open a Bible, and they'll tell you, I love the Bible. I read the Bible every day. This is my source of truth. But they have a different Christ than we have. They have a Christ that doesn't save, beloved. And so just to say, I believe the Bible is not enough. And these are helpful tools to delineate truth and error. Secondly, they draw a line at times between believer and unbeliever. Because when someone comes to you and begins to deny that Jesus is virgin born, begins to deny that Christ will return and for judgment, begins to deny that he rose from the dead, begins to deny that he ascended to the Father, these basic truths we find in the creed, well, they begin to expose themselves, right? That they're outside of what the church deems as orthodox. Thirdly, they protect unity within the church. Now, I know for some, this is, this is you might say, I, I don't see this. Right? Because we've often heard this phrase that doctrine divides. And so when we get more precise, doesn't that just separate us? But a confession sets a standard as to what we all agree upon, where we have unity doctrinally. Everyone in the church does not need to hold to every tenet of the confession. That's not how it works. But it's a public display of what this church believes. Where we agree and where we have room to disagree, where the confession doesn't lay claims. Another benefit is that a creed and a confession connects us, attaches us to historic Christianity. And it protects us from the unending novelty of new theologies and new doctrines that are constantly arising. Uh, the faith is not something that we want to construct, reconstruct every generation, Right? something that needs to be discovered and retrieved, not something that needs to be rebuilt. We're not, when you drive by that building at Asante, you're never going to see them, unless the whole thing falls apart, building a new foundation. Right? The foundation is laid. They're building up from that foundation. And so all we are doing as Christians is coming to that foundation that's already been laid and discovering the truth that has been there for 2,000 years. And so creeds and confessions help the church find their place in that tradition of orthodoxy. Uh, another benefit, and I think this is really a, a positive, is that a confession is an honest, upfront explanation of what a church believes. You come through the door, you see the confession, and you know from day one what it is that you're going to hear and what it is that you're going to get. There's no secret. Right? There's no mystery as to what a church believes when it has a published profession of their faith that all can see and all can scrutinize. It's an honest attempt just to lay our cards on the table and say, this is who we are. This is what we hold to. Sixthly, they provide unity and boundaries for those that preach and teach. In a confessional church, the elders have the freedom to preach within the confines of the confession. For instance, the, the London Baptist doesn't take a position on the millennium. You can be pre-mill, you can be post-mill, you can be ah-mill, and be in line with the confession. But if you begin to deny eternal punishment, or if you begin to deny the bodily resurrection of the righteous and the wicked, well, then you're veering from central teachings of the Bible. And so this also gives the church confidence that you can know what's going to be taught from a given pulpit, knowing what the position of the church is. Uh, seventhly, they preserve Christian liberty in non-essential issues. You know, we have a lot of questions as Christians that, that need wisdom, right? Do we homeschool our kids? Do we send them to a Christian school? Should Christians listen to secular music? Maybe you've been beat over the head by someone that says you're a, you're a sinner because you've done that. Should Christians have a television in their home and, and, and watch said television, right? Um, jewelry, tattoos, should we go out dancing? <laughs> right, these are all issues that churches have taken very hard stances on 
and bound the conscience of God's people one way or another. Now, certainly these questions take sanctified wisdom, but when there is a confession in place, it sets the boundaries of what we do believe, and everywhere where it doesn't speak, we have liberty to use our sanctified wisdom before God and what we think He's leading us. Eighthly, confessions guard against theological democracy. Theological democracy. Now, we're Americans, right? We are independent. We blaze our own trail. Uh, I'm not knocking, you know, being American. Um, but we're, we're democratic in the good sense. We, we want to have our own say and our own vote and do what we please. And we blaze our own trail. We're pioneers. Sometimes we bring that into the church. Right? And I can believe what I want about everything. I am the one that interprets and I don't need the past. I don't need those helps. But creeds and confessions give us guardrails to show us the, the boundaries of what is orthodox. We don't all have to believe the same thing, but there are limits, right, to what a Christian can believe and not believe. And so these prevent from us just sort of having a hodgepodge of grabbing whatever theology we want. Uh, ninthly, they teach us the theological vocabulary of Christianity. I have to admit I'm a little bit jealous of our small children being catechized because they know far more than I did for a long time. Now, I get that they're not putting all the pieces together and what these big words mean, but knowing the confession and knowing the language of the church helps us to read the Bible, helps us to hear preaching, helps us to read other works as we learn how the church has communicated about God for the last 2,000 years and lastly, they are a helpful teaching tool for Christian discipleship. Many a Christians have said these words, I wish I just had a short summary of the Bible's teachings. If someone could just put what the Bible teaches in a little succinct fashion, and I would know what is important. Well, that's what a confession of faith is, and that's what it aims to do, to train new and not new believers to the main tenets of the Christian faith. So I've said plenty. I want to close with a quote, and this is from a man named B.H. Carroll. He was a Southern Baptist. Um, he was the founding president of the so Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. This is what he says. A church with a little creed is a church with a little life. The more divine doctrines a church can agree on, the greater its power and the wider its usefulness. The fewer its articles of faith, the fewer its bonds of union and compactness. The modern cry, less creed, more liberty, is a degeneration from the vertebrate to the jellyfish. and means less unity and less morality, and it means more heresy. Definitive truth does not create heresy. It only exposes it and corrects it. Shut off the creed, and the Christian work would fill up with heresy unsuspected and uncorrected, but none the less deadly. And I'll let those words stand. Let's pray.